I'm going to end on something because Astrid said you have to do this. And this is going to turn some of you off. Uh, it's really going to split the crowd, but, uh, and, 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 you know, and, and be okay with the negative. What the hell was he talking about that for? But other people are going to say it was the best part of the conference. How many of you growing up through junior high, high school, college, in your community, in your, uh, in your synagogue, in your church, have ever known of someone who was suicidal or committed suicide? Raise your hands. Would you say that's like 90%? Yeah, okay. 85%. Okay. So how I learn to channel people is I used to be a high-level suicide interventionist. And one of my mentors was a fellow named Dr. Ed Schneidman. He was the co-founder of the Suicide Prevention Center in Washington and Los Angeles, and he was at UCLA when I was in training. And what would happen is he would see still suicidal patients who needed to be discharged because they weren't acutely suicidal. And the residents didn't want to see them. And so someone on the outside who was stupid and foolish enough to say, I'll see them, uh, had to be available. And that stupid person was me. And Ed would call me, and it was always the same call. Mark, I'm with this handsome young man. I'm with this beautiful young woman. Um, I'm going to go a little bit over it, because we I, I got to finish this for those who it's relevant to. Uh, this, uh, he, this young man is handsome. This woman is beautiful. You could help them, Mark. See them. Always the same call. And so I would see these individuals. And what I realized, this is what I realized, this is where I started abandoning big words. Because I realized if I did checking boxes and I used clinical terms and I looked into their eyes, and I have this way of looking into people's eyes where I could hold on to their eyes and, it's, and they're, they're seeing it, and it's not meant to hurt. When I look into people's eyes, it's finding out where they are. And so I abandoned language, and I saw these people, and eventually what happened, and none of them killed themselves, uh, and eventually what would happen, and you might do your own version with this, is I would say to them, if everything had been tried and it failed. So imagine if you're feeling that. I would say, uh, I'd look into their eyes, and I'd say, if it's OK with you, I'm not going to give you any advice or solutions, which you're just going to fail at and give me something to write down on the record. And then you'll have to come back and tell me why you didn't do it. Would that be OK? So. That's, remember, I can't believe what I'm feeling. It was like, what? Uh, yeah, would it be OK if I, if I didn't do that? And they'd go, OK. And then I had this way of looking into people's eyes, and I'd say, instead, I'm going to find you wherever you are and just keep you company for as long as it takes. And then when you feel it's getting boring for you, we'll come up with solutions. And they just started crying. But everything changed, and this is probably the most profound, whoa, wow, hmm, yes, I've ever experienced, with a patient named Julie. Julie had made four suicide attempts in the previous five years, had been in hospitals two to three months. This is back, I don't know, in the 80s. Uh, and she got discharged, and I was seeing her two to three times a week. I don't think she was catatonic. She hardly spoke. She never looked into my eyes. And it, I think I'd been seeing her six to eight months, and I didn't think I was doing any good. But that was the longest she'd gone without a suicide attempt or being in a hospital. And, there, uh, and I used to moonlight. 
So if you know any residents in medicine or psychiatry, moonlighting means sometimes to pick up extra money, you'll work at a hospital. And so I worked at a state hospital, Metropolitan State Hospital outside of Los Angeles. So it would be a 48-hour uh, thing. Sometimes you'd be up 36 hours, and you're medicating, and you're admitting people. But you get a little bit overtired. So I was overtired after one of those weekends, and there was Nancy on a Monday. And so I come in, and I'm seated with her. So imagine you're me, and this is Nancy. Not quite dead, but. And so how many of you have pulled an all-nighter? And the next morning, your physiology does some really interesting things. I won't, I won't, I won't go into the sphincters, which I just let slip out, obviously. But you know, your teeth move, and your head's kind of wigged out. So that's exactly the state I was in, uh, but, well, you know, but in my mind. So she's like that. And I'm looking out in the room, like I'm looking out in this room. And suddenly, all the color turns to black and white. And I'm looking out at the room, and I'm going, I think I went, whoa, wow, what's that about? Uh, and then it started to get like crushed. I mean, it was like a cold, it was like black and cold. Uh, and it was like, it was like, it was like a highway in the desert when you see the waves off, uh, off the road, except the whole room was like that. And so I thought I was having a stroke or seizure. Now I'm a medical doctor, I'm not a psychologist, so I did a neuro exam on myself. And she's like this, and I'm going like this, like this, like this, like this, and tap my knees, tap my leg. And, and I'm thinking, well, I'm all here. Uh, and then I had this crazy idea that I was looking at the world through her eyes. So that's where all the Steve Jobs goes all the way back. I was looking at the world through her eyes. And because I was overtired, I blurted out something that normally I would keep to myself. And what I said to her was, Nancy, I didn't know it was so bad, and I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. I'll miss you. And maybe I'll understand why you had to. So I said that, and I th first thing I said to myself was, did you think that or did you say that? <laughs> <laughs> the second thing I thought is, do not write that in the medical record. <laughs> uh, and then she looked at me. She looked at me for the first time. First time she made eye contact. And I thought she was going to say, thank you for uh, understanding I'm overdue. Because this, this was the longest she'd gone without a suicide attempt. And I got a little paranoid. And so I looked into her eyes. And I said, what are you thinking? And then she looked right into my eyes the way I, you know, I've been looking to her. And she said, if you can really understand why I might have to kill myself, Maybe I won't need to. And then she gave up her suicidality. And these things are possible for all of us. And again, for those people who say, what did this have to do with the business thing? I apologize. But I think the world is moving away from the conversations that are po possible between us that can not only win business, sell your stuff, but you could save lives. So thank you for letting me depress you at the end. <laughs>